was on social networking and today we're going to hear about wireless networking so you can get a sample of the breadth of topics that comsnet covers um, also the first two speakers were from academia uh, our current speaker dhananjay gore is from, is from industrial research so you get a flavor of how different people or different uh, communities do research in different ways uh, dr dhananjay gore is senior director at qualcomm research india uh, he is responsible for all, all r and d efforts in cellular networks 3g 4g 5g as well as uh, cool work on imaging and virtual reality some of you might have seen the demo yesterday uh, of the ar vr system they have um, he got his btech in electrical engineering from iit bombay in 98 and his ms and phd from stanford university and in 2003 he was awarded the institute silver medal by iit bombay as well as the young alumni achievers award at iit bombay so without further ado i welcome please welcome dr tanjay ko thank you thank you for the introduction and uh, you know thank you all for coming i know it's uh, early bangalore time so i really appreciate uh, all of you coming and uh, hearing me speak uh, so today's talk is uh, on 5g right and i have uh, three three sections uh, roughly uh, really the first part is about introducing 5g uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, what the key motivation is so what what are the drivers for us to go ahead and design a brand new air interface right so it turns out that it's uh, primarily driven by three different things different in the sense that uh, no previous g really looks at so many different things all right so first is about uh, different types of uh, mobile services there's a standard uh, enhanced mobile broadband so that keeps happening every generation but in addition there are actually two new uh, emerging classes of services there's something that we call mission critical and there's something of course massive iot i think by now everybody in this room uh, knows about iot when addition to services uh, 5g is also about uh, handling uh, for the first time really uh, different types of spectrum right different spectrum bands there is a low band there is something called a mid band i'll tell you what that means and of course there's millimeter wave that's definitely your first as far as uh, uh, you know 4g or 3g addressing it is concerned 3GPP has an address uh, millimeter wave, and then the third uh, different kind of thing is really about deployments. That right? we're talking cloud RAN, we're talking about small cells, we're talking about uh, integrated access backhaul. So 5G is essentially a, a unified connectivity fabric that will connect different types of services, different types of spectrum, and different types of deployments uh, under one integrated platform. Right? You can think of it like that. So I'll speak a little bit about where we are in the 5G game, uh, where the standards effort is, and uh, you know how soon or how far we are from actual deployment. In the second half, uh, I'll maybe spend more time on some of the foundational technologies. So what's building up 5G NR? 5G NR. Uh, by the way, 5G is almost never say never say 5G. Say 5G NR. Okay, NR is really new radio. Okay, that's what NR is. Uh, so yeah, I talk about foundational technologies. You know, I talk about uh, the need for a scalable OFDM numerology. Uh, we'll we'll talk about how that actually helps us uh, define this really flexible, very complex but very capable framework to address all these different types of services that we that we'll talk about. Uh, of course, we'll talk about channel coding. Every generation, every 3G, 2G talks about channel coding, and you'll see that it's changing once again. We we'll talk about massive MIMO again. Uh, nothing new about MIMO, and, and part of what you will see is that uh, you know uh, you have I mean, really think of it this way: you are starting uh, uh, a design from scratch, right? Uh, think about the advances in VLSI, in software, in RF, in antenna capability, right? Over the last decade or so, since you last defined 4G, so that gives you the opportunity to. Uh, either you know pull off techniques that were prohibitive initially from a complexity cost perspective, or squeeze more out of techniques that already exist. Right, so MIMO, massive MIMO, falls in the second category. Everybody's heard of MIMO. It's been well, at least 15 years uh, since it's gotten deployed. Right, but we'll see with 5G, you can actually do things from scratch and squeeze even more out from from MIMO. Okay, 
and then we talk about uh, uh, millimeter wave. <clears throat> Last part, uh, you know, I will give you a flavor for what's coming next, right? So the first two parts, you know, okay, why we're doing five G? Uh, what are we really doing in the specifications in in the three G standards? Uh, 3GBP standards process. In the last part, I'll give you a flavor for what's next. So what are the ideas that uh, people are still discussing? Uh, kind of still in you know in play. Uh, we haven't yet kind of put things down into specification, right? So there will be a little bit uh, speculative, uh, but it's I think a fun thing to, to talk about as well. Okay. So with that, and first, right? I think here's this awesome realization, right? So mobile is uh, I would say the largest technology platform ever. We're talking of more than a billion chips, mobile chips sold every year. The level of innovation, level of integration is absolutely unprecedented. What does that mean? Well, think about your mobile handset today, right? What all you have, you have compute, you have CPU, you have GPU, you have DSP, now you have NPU, right? You have connectivity, you have cellular modems, you have WLAN, you have Bluetooth, you have FM, then you have multimedia, you have camera, video, display, technologies, all together in this one small handset. But how do we get there? Right, well, it all started back uh, in 1980s, you can actually go back uh, to that time frame uh, with voice, okay, with analog voice. Uh, and then roughly every decade after that, you will actually see a new generation. So 1980s is 1G, that's how we all think about it. Uh, that's analog voice. About 10 years later, you had 2G, still very much about voice, but you know a little bit more about, okay, how do I, oh, this is a killer use case, how do I squeeze more out of my spectrum? How do I digitize it, right? How do I get higher network capacity? What happened there is, okay, you digitized it, you also got a new waveform, okay? That's the first time we changed the waveform for, from 1G to 2G. Uh, it was about phones, flip phones, okay? Uh, go from 2G to 3G, again, about two, you know, 10 years or so, uh, maybe early part of uh, this century. And you have uh, wireless data making a show, right? You have voice, of course, still there, right? But it was more about 3G, if you think about it, it was more about wireless data. You see the advent of smartphones, the waveform changed yet again, okay? You went from GSM waveforms to CDMA waveforms, okay? Uh, what do I think about it? From 3G to 4G, yeah, it's still about uh, wireless data, but lots of it. Okay, so huge proliferation of smartphones, huge proliferation of, I would say, multimedia consumption. Okay, voice is important, of course, it still is, but you know, you have other kinds of data now showing up and becoming very important. Okay, so 4G, you can think of it as, uh, well, most of this decade, I would say, and we're still scaling in 4G, uh, about the proliferation of smartphones, proliferation of different types of uh, multimedia data, but in this entire journey, it's still very much about about the smartphone, all right? It's very much about a mobile handset platform. So where do we go from here, right? Well, at least in the mobile broadband space, that trajectory of, of demand doesn't change, okay? It still continues. Uh, you have insatiable demand for mobile phones. Uh, the type of data also, you know, that trend continues. Maybe a, a, a large majority of it would be uh, multimedia streaming. And the amount of data consumed every day just keeps on exploding, right? So you are going to see this trend for mobile broadband to be faster, bigger, continue, okay? So what's new? Well, beyond that, 5G is also about new experiences, okay? So you're also already seeing uh, different types of uh, uh, maybe mobile experiences show up. I think you have a bunch of them here. They're talking about rich uh, multimedia, talking about cloud computing, edge computing, talking about uh, augmented reality, virtual reality. By the way, it's together known as extended reality now. Um, and of course, uh, high-speed mobility, all kinds of uh, different types of requirements. Uh, also, different types of devices, okay? That's the, if you want to see trends, this is probably the first time you're also looking at different types of devices. When we were designing 4G more than a decade ago, easily more than a decade ago, it was still about the flip phone. The smartphones really took off 2008 or so, okay? So it's still mostly about the flip phone. Uh, and then 4G kind of, uh, you had to do this backward compatible design. Once you had smartphones come in, you had video come in, right? But where we are today for 5G, we are already seeing different types of devices. You're seeing HMDs for consuming virtual reality. You're seeing connected cars. You're talking about IoT. You're talking about connected V2X. That's regular to 
everything else right so we have the opportunity today to you know to recognize that and to already design 5g for different types of devices different types of of services right and of course uh, <clears throat> operators are continuously looking for new types of services as well right so there's only so much you can do by saying okay all you can be data is only so much value you can extract right so you're continuously trying to take uh, you know consumer mobile broadband and scale that into a bunch of different mobile industries why well because it raises the value of the services that operators provide right so every single operator in the world is looking at 5g as a ways to kind of scale in value okay so that's a uh, that's a little bit of background as to what's driving 5g or what's trying really driving the evolution of 4g to 5g why are we looking at uh, uh, why are we looking at it today as a ways to kind of redefine a, a whole new generation from scratch right so to us really 5g is a, is a unifying connectivity platform right that greatly scales the value of mobile broadband with respect to all the previous generations why well as i said it's it's really about what else you can do besides you know enhancing mobile broadband right so that will continue okay so you will see faster avatars bigger avatars of mobile broadband they are they are emerging use cases they are already virtual reality is is actually a favorite for people in the industry because it's among uh, i would say uh, the stand out use cases where you need very high bandwidth and very low latency okay so that's uh, one of the big drivers for for you know scaling up uh, mobile broadband in addition there's something that we call uh, mission critical services uh, or you know uh, urlc these are techniques to enable uh, mission critical services so let's think about use cases that that can kind of clarify that a little bit more think about doing stuff like uh, telemedicine think about trying to control uh, robots from afar right think about uh, vehicle to vehicle communication right so this kind of class of uh, of uh, communication where you need very high availability which means when you want the channel you need to get it okay you don't have time to sit and you know for scheduling takes time okay you don't have time for that right and when you get it you want it to be super reliable okay so once you start transmitting i want to make sure this thing actually gets across right and we talked about these use cases and you can you know understand why right and also you want these to be super secure so that's like this emerging class of uh, services that we loosely term as mission critical uh, massive iot is i would say yet another class and what differentiates this class we we'll dive into it a little bit later is you know the type of requirements these classes of services place on your on your end interface with iot i think another uh, a good way is to think about uh, uh, comparing it with maybe smartphones right so think about use cases think about um, smart meters right uh, think about uh, what it means when you need a single battery charge to last years up to 10 years right as opposed to maybe a couple of days think about coverage down in your basement that's maybe 15 20 db more in path loss they loosely can think of it like that right you need to extract that from from an air space you need this to be really really cheap right you can't afford to pay hundreds of dollars it has to be some dollar kind of category right you need to have data sipping that is your reading and electricity meter you kind of reading once in a while you're not drinking from the spigot when you are like you're doing video streaming for example right so very different type of uh, data consumption and then think of dimensionality right uh, yeah all of us have smartphones and yeah, there's lots of them around but we are really talking of order of magnitude more connected devices with iot think of what that imposes in the networking world when i mean the networking i mean the signaling uh, side of things when you're setting up connections or tearing them down you're always on it's actually prohibitive okay so what you do in the air interface to support these different types of services actually looks very different uh, the other big thing uh, that's new i would say is is spectrum uh, or more correctly different types of spectrum okay so low band is uh, our traditional cellular world sub gigahertz maybe sub 2 gigahertz or so there's an emerging mid band right uh, up to about 6 gigahertz or so but primarily between 3 to 4 megahertz uh, gigahertz lots and lots of spectrum there and then this part is completely new the high bands millimeter wave uh, and the promise there really is tons and tons of spectrum the hundreds of megahertz of spectrum available uh, so this is the first time 
uh, we are going to be providing a kind of unified support across different spectrum bands in the same area interface. Okay. And finally, with, with deployment, uh, I talk about uh, uh, spectrum sharing and uh, share and basically 5G NR in unlicensed band. That actually leads, that's really required for a whole new type of uh, deployment, uh, virtual private networks uh, for industrial IoT. A lot of discussion on that. Uh, we'll talk about uh, how uh, you can do integrated uh, backhaul and access, uh, especially with uh, millimeter wave. The cell of V2X and a whole new kinds of uh, deployments. Again, you want a unified air interface across, uh, you know, supporting all of that. Great. So, okay, now we have a new interface. Uh, we kind of understand uh, what are, what's driving it in terms of use cases. Let's talk numbers. Okay. So, what's different performance wise for 5G over maybe previous uh, generations? So, here loosely you can see, you know, it's at least an order of magnitude more in most dimensions, right? So we're talking about a decrease of uh, maybe 10x in end-to-end -end latency. Why? Well, think about mission critical services. Uh, LTE has several milliseconds round trip latency, okay? Uh, you can bring it down to about a millisecond or so by some games that you can, that's actually still evolving in the LTE standard. With 5G, you can bring it down to maybe 100 microseconds or so, and we'll see how, okay? Uh, you can think of massive internet of things. Uh, we talked about uh, the curse of dimensionality. Uh, we really need 100x improvement in network efficiency, maybe more than 10x in, in the connection density, right? Uh, that's actually huge. Think about it. Uh, and then, of course, our traditional enhanced mobile broadband, 10x in experience throughput, 100x in, in traffic capacity, 3x in spectrum efficiency. I think all numbers, I think, think, think about spectrum efficiency. Okay, we're talking about 3x increase. How do you do that? Actually, if you have an AWG link, you're pretty much close to capacity today. Okay, so uh, it's actually interesting, and uh, uh, the idea really is to say, okay, we're going to scale the number of antennas, and then of course that that buys you some, MIMO buys you some, but uh, it's not enough, right? You you see that you actually need to design from scratch to really extract all the gains that you can get by scaling up number of antennas. Okay, but we'll get to 3x uh, uh, with that. It's actually very hard. Okay, so fine. So where are we right now with 5G? Okay, so 5G standards were started uh, quite some time ago. All right, and uh, what 5G does is basically there's a bunch of specifications that come out in releases. Okay, release 15 is the first 5G uh, uh, kind of specification. Okay, and uh, the 5G specification for the standalone mode will be complete sometime in mid-2018, uh, so sometime mid this year. But actually, uh, uh, some time ago, a lot of effort started in defining an intermediate mode called NSA. That's a non-standalone mode. The idea was to actually leverage existing cellular networks. So let's say leverage LTE and see if you can bring the advantages of, of 5G, bring the advantages of the physical layer earlier into 5G deployments. All right, so how do you do that? Well, what you can think of is this dual connectivity mode where uh, on one side you're anchored to an ATE base station, right? So that your control channels, your mobility management is all handled with, with ATE. And then on the user plane, you can do 5G. Okay, so the NSA mode is, is roughly that. We'll talk a lot more details about what that is later. But that work is already complete. In the standard model, that work is done. What that lets you do is you know, as we speak, the demo's going on, the trial's going on, and there's actually deployments planned in uh, 2019, early 2019 or so, all based on this uh, NSA mode, right? So fine, this is all 5G. Well, what happens to LTE? That does this mean that LTE you know, withers away? Actually, far from it. Uh, release 15 is not just about 5G. It's only, it's really the specification where 5G first shows up. LTE will continue evolving, especially when you kind of uh, say something like uh, dual connectivity, NSA mode, uh, when you recognize the fact that networks take a while to become mature and kind of uh, provide coverage everywhere. If you look at what's happening in LTE, firstly, the waveform doesn't change. When you go from 4G to 5G, it remains 4VM. There's a whole set of features such as gigabit LTE, set of techniques such as massive MIMO, uh, different deployments, cellular V2X, shared spectrum. That's actually all going to happen in the LTE world today. That's great because we learn a lot from it. And you can actually set them up and they'll all turn out to be foundational for 5G. Right, so actually continuously evolving ITE 
and making it bigger and you know uh, assimilating some of the new services of 5G and AD is going to be critical even for 5G's success. Okay, you can think of it at, like that. Okay, so kind of done uh, with the first part, which was mainly about introduction as to why you know why do we need a 5G, uh, where we are with 5G in terms of standards. Next thing I'd like to talk a little bit more about uh, uh, you know, the techniques. I think I spoke a little bit about some of them. But uh, really what, what, uh, what uh, uh, 5G lets you do, uh, I'd like to reiterate that, is uh, you're, you're you know, designing from scratch. Okay. Uh, and why is that interesting? Well, it's interesting because there have been huge advances in, in uh, let's say, RF or antennas. So you can pack more antennas onto the same space, for example or handle millimeter wave better now uh, in lower complexity, lower cost. Uh, huge advances in VLSI, why is that interesting? Well, it means uh, maybe you can do something like uh, self-contained frames. What does that mean? Well, it means that you can pack a whole lot more of compute in, in, a, in the same area, all right? Uh, lots of developments in, in software. Anyway, the point is that you, can, uh, you should be uh, looking to leverage everything that's happening in, in that world to design this new interface. Why? So that you can push in new techniques, make the links more efficient, make the network more efficient, maybe make existing techniques more efficient as well, right? So worthwhile uh, reiterating this as well, this is just like a blown up picture of just the services portion, okay? Uh, 5G is about services, spectrum deployments. Just looking at services, looking at enhanced mobile broadband by itself, you know, that, as I said, is going to scale. You need fiber light speeds now, multi gigabit per second. You need 10x reduction in latency, right? Maybe order of 100 microseconds or so. At the same time, you want to you know, support a massive IoT, very, very different, ultra low complexity. I don't want to go more than one receiver antenna. I want it to be really, really cost effective. I want it to support 20 dB more in coverage. I want much higher dimensionality, very, very different from enhanced mobile broadband. And then I want, also want uh, mission critical uh, uh, control. Uh, URLNC, ultra reliable, low latency communication. That's the other way people know it by. Uh, that again looks very different. Ultra reliable, I may not be sending a whole lot of data, right? If I'm trying to control a robot, maybe it's a few bytes of data, a few hundred bytes of data, but I want to send that information as soon as I want to send it, right? Very different with, with enhanced mobile broadband. For the most part, you can wait, you can have some latency for scheduling and so on, right? You also want super high reliability. Once I send a control, uh, when I send the information out, I need it to get there, right? Or this robot is going to do something else. This drone is going to do something else that I don't want it to do, right? So very, very reliable and of course, super secure. So look at the uh, dimensionality of design that's already exploded, okay? So we are talking about a set of uh, techniques to achieve this in 5G. Right, so with release 15, what you'll see is uh, most of the foundational technologies for enhanced mobile broadband kind of get in, okay? Uh, and then there's evolution beyond, beyond uh, release 15, release 16, release, release 17, and so on. Uh, but, you know, there's a laundry list of them here that I have uh, kind of uh, put down here. By no means complete. So we talk about uh, scalable OFDM. Firstly, we talk, we talk about why we need scalable neural logic. Okay, we'll, we'll start with that. Then we talk about once you have this scalable numerology, how does it enable you to set up a framework that supports all these different types of services in an integrated platform? We'll of course talk about uh, uh, channel coding. Uh, every generation talks about channel coding. Something always changes, something has changed this time as well. Okay, uh, we talk about massive MIMO and of course, uh, we, we will definitely talk about uh, uh, mobile millimeter wave, mobile being key, okay? Right, so first, uh, why do we need scalability? Right, so this chart shows you, it's like quite an iPhone, I don't know if you can see from the back, but it kind of shows you spectrum on, on the horizontal axis, and these are just different uh, countries, all right? So this region here on the left-hand side is our traditional cellular spectrum, okay, sub gigahertz, sub two gigahertz, thereabouts. This is emerging mid-band from maybe three gigahertz to six gigahertz or so, where lots of spectrum is becoming available for 5G, particularly in the three gigahertz band. And then there's, of course, uh, the ultra high band, you know, in millimeter wave, 28 gigahertz or so with uh, hundreds of megahertz of spectrum. Why do we need, why do we need scalability? Well, we're talking about an air interface, 
that provides a unified platform for all these banks right so these are different uh, spectrum bands and there's also different uh, levels of, of bandwidth okay uh, if you're doing let's say uh, if you want scalability with OFDM think about what happens with ADE today ADE also supports different levels of bandwidth but nothing to the, ex you know, to the extreme case that we have with 5G right so with OFDM or orthogonal frequency division multiplexing this is really when you take a frequency selective channel and you can convert it very loosely into a bunch of parallel channels that all look like flat channels okay so uh, what happens in ITE? Well, uh, we actually define the symbol duration, right? We actually say, okay, the subcarrier spacing is so much, it's 15 kilohertz, and that remains static, no matter how you change your bandwidth. What that means is when you have increase in bandwidth, you have increased in number of tones that has a direct implication on receiver complexity. But more importantly, irrespective of which deployment, you know, you're gonna put OFDM in, it means a symbol duration remains the same. Now think what happens with uh, 5G. Uh, in the sub 6 gigahertz, we are talking about a spectra of a bandwidth from 5 megahertz to 100 megahertz. And when you get a millimeter wave, you're talking about 50 megahertz to 400 megahertz. Okay? You think of the deployments, we're talking about very, very different deployments, very, very different channel characteristics, whether it's the sub gigahertz region or you're talking millimeter wave. So there is a need to actually uh, change symbol duration, for example. Right? So we do that very easily with OFDM, right? we just allow a larger carrier spacing, right? that actually gets you uh, some changes, we talk about what it, does, what it does to your symbol duration, but it allows you to control complexity also because the number of tones reduces if you have larger carrier spacing. Okay? The other thing that OFDM lets you do rather well is you know, efficiently do your windowing so that you can control your emissions, the spectrum emissions both in band and out of band. As far as power, you know, power consumption is concerned, uplink kind of looks the same. Okay, uplink will still be waveform-wise, single carrier OFDM. Uh, you know, get a bunch of uh, peak to average benefits and good P efficiency because of that in ADE. That carries through in 5G. 5G also specifies an OFDMA uh, uh, waveform for, for uplink. All right, that looks different from single carrier OFDM. And I won't go too much into that right now. And finally, and very interestingly, uh, OFDM allows you to uh, a multiplex different waveforms, right? So you don't always have, so for example, I think best again, let's uh, think of a use case. Uh, think about IoT and let's imagine that, uh, you know, I want to do uh, an access less grand. You know, I want to modulate it on, let's say, some kind of uh, uh, spread spectrum waveform. OVM actually allows you to assimilate that in the waveform really well, okay? So these are some of the advantages Right, and then, well, what does it do really for you, right? So what it does is, it buys you this flexibility in both frequency and time, right? So you get a flexible numerology. Great, so why is that interesting? What does it set me up for? Well, it actually sets you up really well to define a very flexible slot architecture, right? What does that mean? We talked about uh, supporting different types of services, right? That's fine, but actually you also need to make this robust. Remember, this generation is going to stick around for at least a decade, right? And yeah, you're seeing uh, evidence of some new services show up, but just like LTE, you're going to have to support services that you have no idea would, would show up, okay? So all of that and more needs to be supported by this uh, flexible framework. So this is like a, it's like a cartoon image, but I'll, I'll walk you through uh, some of the things that, uh, you know, this, this uh, uh, framework already supports in, in release 15. Right, so we talked about uh, scalable slot duration. How do you get there? Well, uh, you know, you can do two things. You can change your intercarrier spacing, and actually, you can change the number of uh, symbols in in every slot. Right, so you can do that in five G. Uh, it allows you flexibility to support different types of uh, uh, deployment paradigms. Okay, enhanced mobile broadband is one cellular paradigm. There's also what's called multicast or single frequency networks. Uh, you guys are familiar with that, and there's D two D. They look very different. If you look at deployments, they actually look very different. Okay, but you can actually have a unified, integrated framework for all these different types of uh, of uh, deployments. We talked a little bit about URLLC, right? So imagine you are doing uh, an EMBB transmission, right? So regular transmission going on, and hey, now suddenly I need to send this uh, uh, highly reliable uh, traffic. How do I do? 
How do I do that, right? So what you do really is the puncture. Right? What you say is, hey, I need to send this information. I need to send it right now. I know I'm sending something else. Too bad, I'm going to puncture it, right? So I'm going to send something, uh, blank out something that I was already sending, and I'm going to send this information instead. Looks OK for URL and C for those guys. But what about the EMBB guys, right? Uh, so your physical layer and Mac layer has to be functioning aware. Otherwise, you get all sorts of performance losses. Right? So you need to, you need to take care of that. Uh, you have these uh, blank subcarriers and blank slots, and that's really for forward compatibility. Right? Who knows what service category you have to support uh, in future? Right? So this ability to insert blank slots or blank carrier actually enables that. Right? And then, of course, there's a self-contained uh, slot structure, which uh, I'll talk a little bit uh, more about. But maybe it's best to talk first about just high level what LTE does today, right? And then you can see the differences, right? So this data center thing, you can think of it as, as an LTE slot, but the slot is essentially a bunch of organ symbols, okay? Think of it like that. And uh, for LTE, a slot is equal to subframe equal to one millisecond, okay? Uh, <clears throat> so what happens on downlink? Uh, in LTE, basically, you first send a control section and says, hey, I'm going to schedule it now, okay? And then what UE does is it says, okay, I, I'll interpret this downlink control and say, okay, I'm scheduled. I'm going to look at this data, demodulate it, decode it. And okay, if I get through, I'm going to send an act. Okay, I'm going to send an acknowledgement saying, I got through. Now that acknowledgement doesn't go here, it goes several subframes later, right? So what you end up having is several milliseconds of end to end latency, right? From the time I schedule to the time I get an acknowledgement that, hey, the UE has gotten it. Right. Why do you do it that way? You do it that way because that delay that you have to send your acknowledgement actually gets you time to process the data. Okay, so you're kind of uh, spreading out, uh, you know, how much compute you need to do, right? For for the data. What do you do in self Well, what we're saying is in the same slot, I'm going to send my download control no change. So still communicating and scheduling on this particular slot. I'm going to send my download data. Okay, that's happening. And then actually, I'm going to turn around with my acknowledgement right away. But this is not, I mean, this is not like something fundamentally new. Those familiar with, uh, with Wi Fi and WLAN are aware that this is almost exactly what happens with, with WLAN. The difference is they're actually putting this now in the cellular context. It never used to be there, right? And what does that get you? It gets you ultra low latencies, right? So if I, if I play this game of changing my subcarrier spacing, and actually at an extreme, I can also play games where I reduce the number of symbols in every slot. I can get latencies or end-to-end -end latencies of about 100 microseconds or so. Okay. Flip side, you've kind of made your compute very picky. Okay, but that's fine. I think that's something that you know the UE has to handle. Okay, moving on, uh, channel coding. Right, as I said, uh, this gets uh, revisited in every generation. Nothing new this time. Yeah, we kind of looked at it again. And uh, when you look at channel coding, you look at it in maybe Two or three different dimensions. First, of course, uh, you know you look at uh, you know uh, energy per bit in terms of performance. You know how good is my code, right? That's fundamental performance. You do look at that. Then you look at it in the context of uh, 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 compute latency. What does that mean? Well, think about control channels that are coming in and saying, "Hey, are you scheduled or not?" Right. So, what do you want to do? Well, you want the demod and decode for those kind of control channels to be really, really fast, right? So, you want very low latency. Uh, kind of uh, uh, demod, decode, uh, kind of compute for those kind of uh, control channels. And then uh, for maybe uh, the, the channels that carry your data, right? Performance is one thing, but there's this big emphasis on power. Okay, so you want, for example, the decode power per information bit to kind of be in control, right? So that's another dimension where you can compare different, uh, you know, coding uh, paradigms. So you looked at, uh, so I mean, the, the standard looked at turbo codes, looked at uh, tail biting, convolutional codes. These are basically used for data and control channels in LTE today. Uh, and then we looked at LDPC and, uh, and polar codes. Okay. So in 5G, LDPC will replace uh, turbo codes uh, for all data channels, right? Uh, they have an advantage when you make the block size really large, right? They have other, some other advantages also in terms of uh, maybe decode uh, efficiency. And then with polar codes, uh, we kind of replace uh, tail biting convolutional codes. So all control channels will carry uh, polar codes. All right. So that's that's a change uh, in 5G with with respect to with respect to 4G. Great. So now we get to uh, uh, MIMO. 
right? So again, I think it's worthwhile uh, going back a little bit and saying we want 3x increase in, in spectral efficiency. Where's that going to come from? I want 3x increase in my cell edge data rates, in my median uh, data rates in a cell, right? Uh, yeah, I'll throw more antennas at it. That's not special. I do that all the time. I'm doing it in, in, in IT as well, right? On the other hand, if I have a you know, steady channel, and this is the other difficulty, right? So static channel, there's actually nothing more you can do, almost nothing more. I mean, you have, you have capa almost capacity achieving codes, I would say, right, that, that are there. So very good, very efficient. So what more can I do with, with, with my mind? So really, it turns out that when you have a wireless link and you have a time-bearing channel, right, uh, the ability to design this from scratch means that you can get to know your channel better. Okay, so that's fundamentally what, what, what's different, right? We're going to leverage TDD reciprocity better. We are going to uh, put pilots or design pilots better so that let you learn this vast MIMO channel better than what we can do today in 4G. And then we are going to actually design these loops. So there's something called rate prediction where you're predicting what your link can, can, can handle. So design these loops to be much faster than, than what's in LTE. On LTE, I think the, it's about uh, 10 milliseconds or more. Okay, if you look at a rate prediction loop kind of uh, latency is about 10 milliseconds or more, we're talking about reducing it 10x to one milliseconds, one millisecond, all right? What does that get you? Okay, so here's, uh, here's uh, one way to look at it. So this is just a, a, a simulation. Uh, this, this white box here is your traditional you know, existing network, four by four MIMO, which means four uh, streams transmitted, a receiver with four receive antenna capability. And then what we said is, okay, let's use the same sites. Let's throw more antennas at it. Let's make them 256, right? And then let's throw in, in addition, all these really smart techniques for you know, uh, reciprocity and PSI and pilots and, and whatnot uh, that we have in 5G. Okay, so that's this pillar here, right? Just with that, actually, you can see that you get uh, you get your 3x gain. Okay. Now, uh, some of you will note that it looks kind of unfair to compare four transmit antennas with 256 antennas, and that's a fair comment. I think the way to look at it is uh, full dimension MIMO, massive MIMO is happening in 4G. You will see gains in 4G over what's already deployed. That goes without saying. Okay. What we are really trying to point out here is actually there's even more gain to be gotten out by designing this from scratch. And that comes about by basically having these low latency rate prediction loops by doing your pilot patterns in a better way and by leveraging reciprocity better, all right? So that's, that's actually incredible. I think uh, MIMO has been around for, for ages now and we are still finding ways to extract more of it, okay? All right, so <clears throat> coming to uh, millimeter wave. So I said earlier that this is actually a, a very, very new thing for a G, okay? For 5G certainly, this is the first time actually in 3GPP that we're looking closely at millimeter wave. And fundamentally, it's about having hundreds of megahertz of, of bandwidth available at very high frequencies, right? What does that let you do? Well, it lets you get to fiber like speeds. Okay, that's, that's really one requirement, right? Uh, how do but there's a bunch of uh, problems with it, mainly that you know you get around that by using massive MIMO to do basically really, really sharp beams. Now at those frequencies, what ends up happening is that these beams look really, really sharp, right? Like pencil-like beads, right? So what does that let you do? It actually lets you reuse the channel multiple times, okay? There's something called basically in space, right? So space division, multiple access. It lets you have multiple beams simultaneously, right? That don't interfere too much, right? So that lets you scale your, your, your capacity in your network, right? Interestingly, it allows actually other kinds of uh, cool uh, deployment paradigms, right? Think about uh, the fact that now you can do uh, access, which is okay, you're transmitting to some users, but you're gonna also do backhaul at the same time, right? Since these beams are on the same frequency, right? So you can use SDMA in, in different ways, right? So uh, that sounds great, but actually doesn't come for free. Uh, it turns out there are uh, really hard problems to solve uh, from the technical standpoint. Uh, we talked about really high frequencies. What that does is actually give you really bad path loss. And the reason you're throwing hundreds of antennas at your base station side is really primarily to get over this path loss, okay? So that's one thing you need to do. You need to substantially scale up your RF environment, so lots more antennas. The other thing you have to really worry about is robustness, okay? So if you are holding a millimeter wave device in your hand, 
you have to worry about things like occlusion, right? When you just turn it around, if your antennas are facing the other side, then actually you get this big blocking loss, right? You get this big blocking loss even with, with your body. You get blocking loss with full eyes. You get problems with non-line of sight because this thing is bouncing off. So line of sight works best. You need to make non-line of sight work, but it's all robustness problems, okay, that are extreme with millimeter wave. And then, of course, uh, uh, on the device side of things, you know, you need to fit this new RF. You need to fit this new set of antennas into an antenna into a small phone form factor. Okay, and then that's not it's not over, and you still have mobility to deal with. Okay, so uh, we said that it's not just about millimeter wave. It's not a static channel. We are talking about 5G users on millimeter wave walking around in a mobile way. They're going in from one base station to another, all doing millimeter wave. Well, what's wrong with it? Well, you have all those robustness problems to deal with, right? So very loosely, you need to use very smart and very fast beam steering to address this mobility. And that's not enough. You actually need to do very fast uh, access point switching also. And it turns out even that's not enough. You have to be really, really robust. You actually need to anchor it with, uh, with uh, I would say, like a low band, right? Like a sub-6 gigahertz band. Why is that? Well, actually, that's what 5G lets you do. Remember, we said we started by saying that we do a unified air interface, but this is one huge advantage, right? So you have a unified air interface. Think of a dual connectivity where you in a small cell, right? So you're talking millimeter away with uh, something near you, right? And that's going at multi gigabit per second. But hey, when you kind of move out of coverage, you still have the sub six gigahertz to kind of fall back on. Okay, so that's roughly how millimeter wave will evolve or will get deployed in in five uh, G. Sounds great. Uh, well, what about the gains? Uh, again, when you think of point to point, that seems uh, fairly straightforward. Uh, fiber light speeds, awesome, right? But what does it mean in a network context, in a cellular layout context? I think one big question is always about coverage, right? So here's one shot at it. I'll, I'll walk you through what what this uh, what these numbers are. But one way to look at this is okay. Let me co-site millimeter wave with let's say existing. LTE, LTE base stations or tomorrow sub six gigahertz 5G and R, right? What does co-siting mean? I have a base station that does LTE. I'm going to throw a lot more antennas on it and also support millimeter wave, okay? Then what I'm going to do is actually I'm going to run a simulation, right, a coverage simulation. I'm going to take a, a, maybe a typical city. I'm going to look at uh, a particular deployment and says, okay, 48 cells per square kilometer. Now these cells could be macros or they could be small cells and that's what changes in this dimension. And then what I define is a minimum acceptable QoS. That I say, hey, unless I get, let's say 0.4 bits per second per hertz, I'm not going to support a user with millimeter wave. Right? So that's putting a coverage requirement. Right? I need to have my channel at least as good to support 0.4. But if 0.4 sounds small, but now throw 100 megahertz at it. Now we're talking about 40 megabit per second. Okay, so it's a very acceptable uh, QoS level. So what you do then is say, okay, I'm going to define this coverage level, and every user that can see at least 0.4, I'm going to migrate to to a millimeter wave, right? So these numbers here, 81% and 65%, are essentially telling you the fraction of users that can be offloaded, right, onto millimeter wave. Now that coverage problem doesn't look too bad, right? So, I mean, this kind of changes, it's about 40% to 80% across uh, all sites of uh, deployment uh, uh, kind of environments. Uh, you know, you can learn a lot more. There's a very nice white paper at this, at this uh, link that tells you a lot more about the simulation methodology, what terrains were, were kind of modeled and so on and so forth. But this is pretty substantial. Why? Because for almost half the time, you are actually freeing up very valuable sub-6 gigahertz spectrum. That's yet another way you can think of, you know, what the promise of millimeter wave is. Great. So I talked about NSA, which is this non-standalone mode, right? So good questions to ask are, what do early 5G deployments look like? What do early 5G users experience as they go from in and out of, you know, 5G coverage? Right? Now I see a 5G small cell, now I don't, right? Now I see gigabit fiber like speed, now suddenly I don't. How do I get the advantages of 5G as soon as possible, right, to, to the whole ecosystem? It turns out that NSA mode, dual connectivity between 5G and LTE, has a lot of good answers for all these questions. What is it fundamentally? Fundamentally, it's saying that, hey, I have an LTE, existing LTE network already that provides me pretty good coverage. I'm going to leverage it, 
it gives me very good mobility management i'm going to leverage it right so i'm going to anchor myself on an existing 4g network and then i'm going to augment that with a 5g waveform uh, on maybe another channel okay so what does that do so let's say you kind of uh, lay out small cells with uh, 5g nr millimeter waves right so while you're there within the coverage zone you can experience you know 5g like uh, uh, connectivity as soon as you get out of that space uh, either you kind of fall back onto a 6 uh, you know, sub 6 5g nr or in the early days it will be lte okay so that's that's really what this idea is about and depending upon who you are in the world in terms of you know operator side some operators uh, want to get there very quickly with nsa other operators are willing to wait okay what does that look like in in uh, let's say the epc epc is by the way evolved packet core this is the stuff that's outside the ran so beyond the e node b okay so you have a in the initial days you'll have a multi mode device so this is an nsa ue that can do both lte as well as 5g right so you have a existing 5g uh, sorry 4g uh, uh, layout you're going to go augment that with let's say 5g in our ran okay so only the radio side of it now this this ue can essentially do all its lte traffic and its control and user plane over lte but only the user plane over over the 5g ran in initial days that's what it look like that's what nsa is about right so you you get the point if i fall out of coverage okay this goes away but i still have this link right i have all my mobility i have all my control and i have lte data okay eventually what will happen is well the core will also change so epc will become ngc is next generation core okay so that's a brand new 5g core i think the point is you don't want to wait until that part of the puzzle is all worked out to get the benefits of 5g right that's the whole whole promise of uh, nsa right so that pretty much concludes my my second part uh, and uh, you know beyond this it's really a glimpse on what's coming up next right so it's going to look speculative but it's actually fun to talk about because these are ideas that are kind of still in they're still churning people are still trying to figure out what's the best way to make them happen in a specifications uh, context okay so release 15 will set the foundation for enhanced mobile broadband it's not going to stop there it's going to keep evolving there will be release 16 there will be release 17 right so let me tell you what work item and study item means work item means that this particular idea ur llc in the context of mission critical services is actually going into the spec as we speak so people are working on it to the ideas that were presented now we're working on it to write the spec language okay literally so that actually happened in release 15 The, the stuff that's out there that's that's still evolving cellular v2x that's a study item which means we will study you know companies around the world not just companies researchers around the world will study this and come up with okay different proposals the work items will be in subsequent releases okay so they'll get in the spec later uh, non orthogonal multiple access rsma these are all ideas for massive iot we'll talk about that shortly this is actually a disruptive uh, kind of idea uh, already has made itself kind of solely there in ite but uh, this is the first time we'll actually be taking it into 3gpp okay that's about uh, taking uh, uh, lte initially and now 5g nr in the unlicensed space okay i'll talk about that actually and then of course millimeter wave you know we just started talking about uh, mobility there's so many more things you can do with it integrated backhaul access that actually has uh great implications on how you deploy out networks so backhaul is is a huge problem i think many of you are aware of that uh milli, millimeter wave actually gives you a way to maybe you know alleviate that okay so we touch upon that a little bit okay so iot so maybe let's take a step back and uh, understand it uh, understand as to the genesis and and how it actually come across right so lte started maybe about 10 years ago with release 8 okay and and it uh, it's a uh, design paradigm was i want a generational performance advantage mobile broadband with respect to 3g and that did spectacularly well okay for those who remember it started with cat 4 hundreds of megabit per second there's also cat 1 which was like 1 megabit per second which i'll talk about later but really it was about pushing the high end okay so 150 megabit per second and today we have over a gigabit per second so that part lte did beautifully Okay, keep scaling up, keep adding MIMO, keep adding carriers, and keep pushing the data rates up to actually 1.2 gigabit per second now. 
same time a few years ago i think uh, the whole discussion on m2m and iot started right so this is a whole different class of devices we talked about uh, for example smart meters similar other use cases exist where you're talking about high dimensionality very low power so very low complexity needs to be very cost effective very high coverage very different type of of data consumption right so over the last couple of years you see actually it scaled down okay so it continued pushing up but it actually scaled down as well right so today with lte or at least features of lte like emtc and nb iot you can support tens of kilobit per second all the way up to you know 1.2 gigabit per second right in a single in a single uh, uh, air interface that's pretty spectacular okay and how did that all kind of come across as i said you know cat 1 1 megabit per second or so was defined way back in in release 8 Release thirteen was really when we defined EMTC and NB IoT, two new classes of devices, CAT M1, CAT N1, right? One for EMTC, one for NB IoT, which actually gave you highly reduced complexity, single receiver antenna only. LTE when it was first defined was for dual RX, okay? Uh, very low power, so huge battery life, deep coverage, sixteen, fifteen, fifteen, sixteen, twenty dB extra coverage, and allows does some work on you know alleviating the signaling overhead, okay? With release 14, this was more about. So this is a foundation. Okay, all of this was foundational for IoT in release 13. In release 14, it was about. Okay, let me add voice. I want to add voice to IoT. I want to uh, uh, add uh, location services. Why? Because I'm going to you know put these IoT devices on on shipments. And I want to track them. Okay. So evolution continued. And in release 15, lot of focus again on power. So lot of ideas going into wake up radios. And then beyond that, in release 16, release 17, we're talking about different types of deployments. we're talking about using uh, i guess resource spread multiple access uh, grand free uplinks right uh, different types of deployments with multi hop mesh right so all of these ideas are being discussed in the context of iot iot will be based on it for quite some time okay and then eventually release 16 release 17 once there's a demand for it in the market you will see it kind of migrate to 5g okay uh, this is yet another disruptive idea i think i'm running out of time so i'll I'll try and hurry this up, but really the question, the fundamental question asked is this: I have this really well-defined, very effective, very efficient waveform in cellular, right? LTE, right? Very scheduled uh, system. Why can't I take LTE waveform and put it in unlicensed? Okay, there's no reason you can't, by the way, right? There's no such thing as, you know, LTE belongs only to the cellular world. It belongs only to licensed spectrum, right? In fact, because it's licensed, because people have spent so much money on it. There's been so much innovation to make it very, very efficient. So, question asked more than five years ago was, why can't I take LTE and put it in unlicensed, right? So that's exactly what LTE U is, LTE unlicensed. Okay, and it started more than five years ago. There's actually an LTE U forum work with uh, multiple with multiple companies. Uh, it went to LAA license. I think it's uh, I think license authorized access or something. But it's really about. Uh, the same ideas taking lte and unlicensed but now in the 3gpp context both lte u and laa have to be anchored on license spectrum that's important okay so if you anchor on an existing license channel and then you can augment with unlicensed there is all a bunch of problems right for example you have to take care of uh, listen before talk and things like that so all that happens in laa multifier is the stand alone version of it so no anchor carry required so it's truly i'm going to take lte modify it so that it adheres to the requirements of unlicensed band and i'm going to take it and plonk it in an un unlicensed spectrum okay completely stand alone very very disruptive and in the 5g context we are essentially saying that this is the first time by the way so there is no 3gpp version for i mean discussion for multifier the discussion in in 3gpp is in the 5g context in a stand alone context uh, but it's the multifier you know evolution Right, so what are the ideas here? There's NR based LAA, right, which is again okay. I have licensed and unlicensed. I'll be anchored on uh, basically either 5G NR or on LTE, and in unlicensed, I will do 5G NR. Right, so think of it as leveraging available spectrum. There's a standalone unlicensed port where I'm going to take 5G NR, suitably designed, of course, to take care of uh, unlicensed spectrum, and then put it there without any license anchor. Okay, it's the evolution of of multifier, but this is this is in 3GPP. 
Uh, and then finally, of course, on, on millimeter wave, I think we have just got started talking about point to point and how it improves your coverage. You can kind of offload a lot of uh, uh, pressure spectrum in some 6 gigahertz, but it does, it allows you to do a lot more. It allows you to do things like alleviating backhaul problems with this integrated access and backhaul paradigm. Uh, there's all sorts of work going on. Actually, some of this is happening in my group in Bangalore uh, on uh, unlicensed spectrum, right? How do you take uh, multi uh, millimeter wave and deploy it in unlicensed spectrum in the 5G context, right? And of course, there's work in opening up even higher uh, spectrum bands, right? So that's uh, really, I mean, just concluding remarks, you know, you should look at 5G as a platform for innovation. And that's what it really is. And ultimately, you know, the one, the, the way to kind of uh, part with it is to say that it's about basically providing a unified connectivity fabric that greatly enhances the value of mobile broadband beyond anything that previous generations have done. Right? That's that's a good way of saying it. That's uh, with that. I'll, I'll close. Uh, thank you so much uh, for for listening. Uh, open to questions. you, Joseph Noel from the Basic Internet Foundation. When you say that, uh, I'll, I'll be a bit provocative, when you say that 5G is the basis for innovation, we haven't seen innovation from telecom operators during the last years, point one. Uh, point two, uh, you are not tackling the societal challenges of connecting everyone in the rural space. Example, Africa. What is 5G doing uh, in those cases? And how do you want to get the operators to become innovative? Okay, so I think with respect to innovation, right? I think it's a it's a platform for innovation. Operators are looking at different types of services, right? So that's one area for them. But ultimately, if I look at the world today, right, connectivity is pretty much disrupting almost every industry, right? Whether it is uh, the automobile industry or IoT or wherever, and 5G is going to be there everywhere. It's kind of enabling this connectivity in all different such type of industries, right? So the innovation is certainly there in that context. It's not just about mobile broadband anymore. It's about connectivity everywhere in one unified platform. And so it's plenty of innovation in, in that context. With respect to maybe underserved uh, places of the world, I think there's uh, lots of other problems as well, right? Uh, which may not just have to do with uh, with availability of spectrum or or uh, you know access. And there's this whole deployment uh, paradigm that has to also get solved, right? So by, by which I mean by which I mean if you want to if you want to provide uh, services, sell the services to let's say areas with uh, very low density of users or you know way into the interior. You have to first provide back on that, right? So that tends to be really, really expensive, right? And there's all sorts. I mean, it's not. I mean, there is a lot of innovation going on in that space uh, in the 5G world, but certainly outside that also, right? So there's uh, there's uh, efforts uh, we're trying to do satellite back on, right? So all that will happen. And then you can just have 5G on top. So either you can have it in the context of 5G, or you can have it happen anyways. But you can always provide 5G once once that is on. Thank you for the nice talk. Uh, my question is not about the advantages of uh, 5G, uh, more related to the drawback, because you are drawbacks. The drawbacks. Maybe a drawback, uh, because uh, the operation is in big band and uh, high band, 6 gigahertz and 24 gigahertz. Don't you think that these frequencies will affect the health of the people, because you are continuously exposed to these frequencies? Because these frequencies cannot travel, they degrade very fast. You need cells everywhere, and that makes problem for plants, the human beings. Do you think that it will be a problem for uh, the health issues? No, great question. But you know, I'm not a qualified person to to talk about uh, those aspects of uh, uh, you know of uh, millimeter wave. I just want what to know: what are, are there any studies on this? So I think what I do know is, uh, you know, the industry does take these things seriously, right? Does define uh, all kinds of, uh, and especially the context of millimeter wave, right? Uh, I think people do look at, uh, you know, how how close is this thing to your body, for example, right? So that that does that does get addressed. 
But as to the effects of that, I, I don't think I'm yeah, qualified or mere do I have much understanding of that. Thank you, sir, for information session. I want to ask that uh, you are talking about the SMMO millimeter wave, and on the other aspect, you want to save the energy at the base station because if we increase the antenna to 256, it's consume more energy. So, how it is with the green network we are going towards? So, uh, oh, oh, no, no, okay. So, I think you should look at it slightly differently. When, when we say that MIMO gives you performance benefits, it's actually usually with a total power constraint. So the total amount of radiated power is you don't keep scaling it up, right? So does that address your question? So it's not like okay, I have one antenna and then I make four antennas and I have uh, six dB of additional power. It doesn't work like that. There's a total power constraint that's based upon all sorts of other other considerations. Right? But 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 it's a fair question. You know how I think there is there is a lot of uh, I mean not not about the transmit power but in, just in general about green. Right, uh, and that's there definitely is a theme in 5G about how do you make your base stations more green in terms of let's say I don't have too many users, uh, do I still keep transmitting pilots all the time, for example, or do I figure out a way of you know, shutting off and just coming back in once I see users? So, there, there definitely is, is uh, uh, some work going on. There. So, Dr. Banerjee, we have a So, this question is somewhat important. So the other revolution in telcos and mobile telcos is, um, is the network functions virtualization, which seems like a complementary and much needed uh, technology in terms of making some of your uh, new applications, particularly the low latency, high throughput applications real. So I, I would like to sort of hear your perspective on how crucial do you think this is? Because there's been a lot of talk about NFP and 5G together. But I was kind of surprised that you didn't mention it in, in some uh, way in your talk. Uh, so yeah, so there is there's actually a lot of interest on virtualizing network functions. Uh, there's a lot of interest on its compute, for example. I think that's probably very good, yeah. So there's uh, actually a tremendous amount of effort going on in that space, right? So I may not have addressed it today, but there definitely is, a, I mean, that's a high value kind of future uh, thing that's going to happen, right? With respect to my thoughts on it, I think, uh, you know, this is going to happen, right? So it's going to enable new services, it's going to enable new, new applications. Not sure what the question. So the question is more around how crucial do you see, you're making it real, right? So how crucial do you see it um, playing a role in, in your deployments? Okay, fair enough. Uh, I, I, think, uh, I think it's fair to say that uh, the talk today was more about RAM, right? So uh, I didn't quite address the network side of things, right? But I do know that there's immense interest from operators. And uh, they are, I mean, when you ask how crucial it is, I mean, operators are, are busy, not operators, sorry, infra vendors are busy, you know, figuring this out right now. So my understanding of that space is that it, it will happen, but there's a fair amount of design work yet to be done in that space. I'm just curious to know what are the challenges when you go from LT to LT unlicensed? And once you move from uh, LT to unlicensed, are there, is there any perform possible performance degradation Because an unlicensed band, right? Yeah, so great, great, great question, actually. So uh, I think you should look at it this way. Uh, ultimately, if you are going to be in an unlicensed band, right, you have to do two things, right? You have to adhere to whatever norms there are in that band, whether it's you know, spectral leakage or transfer power, things like that. And then you've got to be a good neighbor, right, to other existing technologies, right? So uh, there are complexities with both of these uh, kind of uh, requirements. Uh, for example, with LAA, right, uh, you have to now do LBT. You have to do listen to talk, right? With multi five and go stand alone, we'll do a whole lot more. So there are definitely design challenges, right? This is your change away from, you can't touch it all the time. You have to be a good neighbor to, to maybe, uh, Another transmitting uh, technology. I think what uh, what we found though was that uh, it turns out that LTE once you design it properly to coexist in, in unlicensed ends up being a better neighbor to other unlicensed technologies than if you were to just keep the problem. Okay. So uh, yes, it's a hard problem, uh, and a fair amount of uh, actually quite a lot of innovation is going to making sure that LTE can work. LTE and tomorrow 5G will work in unlicensed.
So just one last question for myself. Uh, so your thoughts on NB IoT versus low rock and the unlicensed from IoT technology. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, okay. So let me address it this way. The advantage you really have with uh, NB IoT in in the poetry context is is actually multiple, right? So it's about having uh, a kind of something standardized and deployed around the world, right? So NB IoT will the easy ways of deploying it in the NB context, for example. Okay. Uh, so you have uh, standard support that allow you interoperability among different types of devices, different networks, different operators, right? Uh, so there are those advantages for sure. I think whether you want to use LoRa or whether you want to use NB IoT will come down to you know what technology is best suited for the application, right? And uh, of course there'll be cost discussions, spectrum availability, all of that. But it will come down to some kind of uh, it has to you have to pick the technology that works best for it. But there are definite advantages with being uh, in the 3 gpp Okay, great. Uh, I would like Archan to. Give a moment to the keynote speaker, Frank Dante. Okay, uh, that ends the morning session. We will start at 11 for the two.